Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. What a great turnout. Um, on behalf of the Gay and Lesbian Archive of Mid-America and the Kansas City Public Library, again, thank you for coming. What a whirlwind couple of weeks it's been for the LGBT communities. And hopefully tonight's presentation will give us some perspective on the changes that have occurred in the past couple of weeks. My name is Stuart Hines, and I am Director of Special Collections at the UMKC Miller Nichols Library, where I also wear a quite fetching chapeau of co-founder of the Gay and Lesbian Archive of Mid-America. Um, before we begin our, our proceedings this evening, I'd like to take a few moments to extend our thanks to uh, the folks who made this evening possible. Uh, first of all, Caitlin Horseman, Associate Professor in the Communication Studies Department at UMKC for doing all the coordination of tonight's event. The very crack staff here at the Kansas City Public Library who make an event like this seem effortless even though we all know otherwise. And finally, Donors to and supporters of the Gay and Lesbian Archive of America, without whose incredible generosity, none of this research would exist at all. So to them, I extend my deep, deep and profound appreciation. Before I introduce my fellow panelists, and while I got you all captive, let me let you in on a couple of upcoming events. On February 26th, Inc., that free magazine from the Kansas City Star, will publish their first LGBT-oriented insert. It's called the Phoenix Newsletter, and Glamour will, uh, has produced uh, an article on the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom for that publication, so watch for that a uh, week from Wednesday. On March 1st, at the Blueford branch, a really, really exciting opportunity to see Walter Nagel, who is the surviving partner of Bayard Rustin, who was involved with the civil rights movement in the 60s. Really an incredible opportunity um, that I hope everyone will take advantage of. On March 12th, another incredible opportunity, a bingo fundraiser at Hamburger Mary's, <laughs> led by the legendary Melinda Ryder, Melinda uh, will be the MC for the fundraiser for Glamour at Hamburger Mary's. Long performed by Bruce Winter. Bruce and Kirk, huge supporters of Glamour, are in the audience tonight, and they are celebrating their 32nd anniversary as a couple. <laughs> Finally, on, if you're attending the Hartman Men's course, upcoming concert on March 29th or 30th. Get there a little early, because I'll be doing a pre-concert talk on Kansas City in the 70s. The program is called I Am Harvey Milk. It's a musical production based on the life of Harvey Milk. And so they asked Glamour to put Kansas City's uh, 70s experience in front of the audience before the production. So watch for that. But tonight, we are talking about Kansas City gay and lesbian advocacy groups. And with me are two, I am very pleased to say, riveting speakers, Kay Madden and Kevin Charlow. Kay Madden is an alum of the UMKC Law School, go Ruse. She graduated in 1983 and has practiced law ever since. She's a member of the firm SLU, Keneally, Irwin and Madden LLC, where she handles the firm's family law, probate, and estate planning cases. She and her life partner, Marsha, have been together for 29 years. <laughs> Kevin Charlotte graduated from the Missouri State University with a bachelor's degree in history before becoming a secondary teacher. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in American history at UMKC, primarily researching 19th century labor with an emphasis on slavery and unionization and the politics surrounding them. Later this spring, he will pr be presenting the research he's discussing tonight at the 56th Annual Missouri Conference on History, and he plans to continue to pursue his education, uh, ultimately with a PhD in American history. So tonight, 
we will discuss the struggle for gay and lesbian rights in Kansas City, primarily focusing on the groups, the various groups who spearheaded those efforts. Our time tonight is very brief and it's a complex history, so what we will focus on is really an overview of the past five decades of that activity, starting first with the 1960s. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Charlo. Uh, as Stuart introduced me, I uh, really want to thank him and the Gay and Lesbian Archives uh, for really the collections and all the research that was available for me. Uh, this is my first sort of conference presentation of ever. <laughs> so you guys are all witness to that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, honestly, without the collection and without all the available material at the archive, none of this would have been possible. So um, if you haven't been to the archive, please go check it out. Uh, like you said, I'm discussing the 1960s, uh, which kind of began I kind of had to. I was taking a 1960s class at UMKC, and uh, it started as a term paper that I really just kind of fell in love with, expanded it into a kind of publishable article, and that's what I'm working towards now. Um, it started for me kind of a, a connection between the homophile movement of right after World War II, uh, a more conservative gay organization grouping where they're really focusing on ways to make people's lives better without really being super open. There's still tons of pressure, tons of worrying about police entrapment, things like that. And the shift to the 70s open liberation area. And the 60s kind of fit right nicely in the mid middle. And I wanted to kind of find out what, what caused that transition, really. And in doing so, uh, I luckily ran ac across Glamour. I was focusing more on just nationwide history, and then I found all of this great stuff on just Kansas City in general. And it really, really focused my attention on, wow, Kansas City played a pivotal role in that transition to the gay liberation movement. Uh, most, most people tend to think of the Mattachine Society, uh, Daughters of Belatus, the One Inc., those early gay rights movements as really the things. But what I found was Kansas City really was an impetus for the movement, and it started with the, this guy. Drew Schaefer was 30 by 1966 when he founded the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom, which, uh, if, for those of you who don't have any knowledge of what that is, that was the first gay organization in Kansas City, and at the time, it was the 16th gay organization nationwide. So. Kansas City really was kind of on the forefront. Uh, but it, it starts before that. Drew Schaefer had become like a real kind of popular guy, huge part of the gay community here in Kansas City by the mid-1960s through the entertainment district. Um, those of you growing up, even, even my straight-laced mother knew about the Jewel Box, the Rail Room, Arabian Nights, the Redhead Lounge, the Colony. Anybody? Yeah? OK, so I see some hands. Uh, the, the gay community here in Kansas City really kind of developed around that entertainment district, the bar district, uh, the community really coming and getting to know each other. What Kansas City lacked uh, by the mid-1960s was the political organizations that had kind of come up in LA, San Francisco, uh, New York, Chicago, some of those major cities that you think of when you think the gay rights movement. Kansas City just lacked that. But they were not going to just settle. Drew Schaefer, uh, decided to form a political group. Now, it started as an, a subsidiary of One, uh, One Inc. from Los Angeles. He created One in Kansas City, so like a subset of One, in early, early, early 1966. And I say early because I, I honestly could not pinpoint the date, but it happened before one of the major and really unknown to a lot of people events in the gay rights movement, which was the National Planning Conference of homophile organizations, which happened in February of 1966. And what that was, February 18th through the 21st, gay rights organizations from around the country came right here to Kansas City and met at the State Hotel, which no longer exists. But they really tried to bring 
a bunch of disparate, autonomous, like local groups together under an umbrella organization which they formed, which I don't know if many of you have heard of it, it's called NACO, the North American Conference of Homo Homophile Organizations. And the goal being, all these local entities that were focused on helping younger gays come out, uh, helping provide social services to uh, people in their cities, they were trying to kind of group everybody in together into a national group to kind of push the movement forward, start focusing on political efforts. Uh, some of the first things they focused on were homosexual exclusion from the military, uh, the crim criminal statutes that specifically targeted gays, uh, issues of entrapment and things like that. Kansas City really was the birthplace of that kind of national impetus towards moving towards a broader focus than just something in the local areas. And right after the conference, Schaefer not, I mean, I don't know much about him personally, but I get the sense that he was not really super happy about being lorded over by some LA organization. They broke off and created the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom. And for the next five years, Freedom, or the uh, Phoenix Society was really the kind of mover and shaker in the gay community nationwide. Uh, they started publishing pamphlets, having social hours, holiday parties. Uh, they, they were one of the first organizations that I could find that published something in coordination with government. They published a pamph pamphlet in coordination with the, uh, the Kansas City Public Health Department on issues affecting venereal disease in the gay community to try to get you know, gays who didn't know where to turn and what to do help. Uh, they took up some national campaigns pushed by NACO, uh, like I said, the homosexual exclusion for the military, criminal codes targeting gays, and uh, one of the quotes from their, uh, their press releases kind of just kind of tells you how militant the gay community was starting to become even as early as 1966. Uh, they said that we, the gays were forced into second-class citizenship through Gestapo-like purges from employment. So they weren't holding any punches. Uh, the, big, the big thing that Phoenix should be known for the most is publishing. Uh, you see some of these different uh, magazines. This is from the Mattachine Society, the big, one of the first gay organizations around. Uh, they published the Mattachine Review, uh, One Inc. This is their magazine, the latter from the Daughters of Belatus, and then the Phoenix Society. The Phoenix Society really become, become the true publisher of anything gay-oriented in, in the nation because Drew's father had worked for a printing company. And Drew's father per purchased him a printing press that they put in the home that you're going to see here in a little bit. And really, all these gay organizations from around the country were, would send their magazines their notices, their newsletters, pamphlets, everything, to Kansas City to have it reprinted, copied, and distributed nationwide. And through my research, I kind of found like there wasn't really any great explanation for, okay, why in February of 1966 are there 16 gay organizations in the entire country? And by 1970, there are over 300. Well, the, the issue is the proliferation of these materials, and Phoenix was really the group that was doing that. They were the ones printing, copying, and distributing it nationwide to anybody they had met that would take it. And that proliferation of materials helped isolated gays in communities that didn't really have a political establishment kind of realize that, hey, I'm not alone. It's okay to come out. It's okay to organize. And things will get better. And the Phoenix Society played a pivotal role in that, and I can't stress that enough. Some of the other things they did, you could still see there was that militant push that they wanted to go further, but there was also that kind of like hold back sentiment in the gay community in the 1960s. Uh, almost every single leader I, look, I came across in the Phoenix Society um, through their correspondences, they all use pseudonyms still. Even in, even in correspondence with fellow gays that they had met in person and knew everything was okay corresponding with them, they all used pseudonyms. They were still afraid to come out. They were also worried about relying on their own discussions to kind of push the issue. They kind of had a, a retreat towards respectability. And what I mean by that is they would rely on the opinion of experts. 
Uh, they put out a press release called The Homosexuals, which was about a CBS documentary that was gonna be coming up. And they had compiled 29 separate studies from the Kinsey Report, if you've ever heard of that, all these different psych psychologists and psychological reports on homosexuality. Show, having doctors say that you know, it's a biologically normal thing. Uh, they talked about the psychiatric effects of mistreatment. They, they really didn't want to make those cases themselves. They wanted to have respectable, middle-class, white doctors make that case for them uh, so as not to push the envelope too far. Uh, Phoenix really hit the ground in 1966, like I said, but where it really got big, and here are some other magazines, is at this point, 1968. You see that house on the magazine? That is 1333 East Linwood Boulevard, which, it, if you want to drive by it, it does not exist anymore. The house has been torn down, but it's right across from the Kansas City Sc Scottish Rite building. And uh, Drew bought this house himself, and it became like the haven for mid-American gays. He and his partner Mickey Ray lived in the top floor, but the middle two floors were basically just community centers. There, were, there was a lending library, uh, they had social parties and meetings, uh, homosexuals who had been kicked out of their house and were living homeless had the ability to stay here if they needed to. Uh, there was a printing press down in the basement, like I said, they were all working and distributing all this information. They, the Phoenix Society, like at this point, this was its apex. But if you notice the date, 1968, what's right around the corner here? Stonewall. And there's, there's this combination of why Phoenix fails. Or I wouldn't say fails, because they were so important, but why they kind of collapse. Well, first off is this. This was a great idea, great in intention, great in everything but planning. Schaefer didn't have the money for it. And Frank, like, he, that's a big house. Like, I couldn't imagine spending all that coin on that house. He ends up going bankrupt because of it. But the other impetus that really kind of plays the downfall in Phoenix is Stonewall. You've got the kind of younger generation who are more, more willing to be open, more willing to kind of fight back against discrimination versus the older group that's kind of still hiding behind respectable opinion, uh, taking it slow, try, trying to just push the envelope as far as they can without crossing a line. And Schaefer ends up going into 18 years of getting out of this debt. Uh, in 1970, the year after Stonewall, uh, NACO disbands, Phoenix kind of tries to keep up with the pace. They shift more from community organizing and sort of like these events that kind of just help Kansas City guys to protest marches, but they just never seem to keep up and the rise of the gay lib movement kind of just kind of sweeps over them. But I can't, I don't want to diss either of these guys' presentations, but if you, if you don't remember anybody else, you got to remember Schaefer. He's really the founder of Kansas City gay rights. Without him, I don't think anything that Stewart is about to talk about in the 70s is really possible in terms of a smooth transition from the homophile era to the liberation area. The, the, the expansion of gay organizations from 1966 to 1971 is just incredible to see. And there's no other explanation for it other than that dispersion of ideas. And if anybody played a huge part in that, it was the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom and Drew Schaefer. So, thank you. Good job. Schaefer also worked with this guy, Foster Gunnison, who was a nationally known uh, gay rights advocate based in Florida and Connecticut. And there's a, a lot of Kevin's research came from the correspondence between Gunnison, his papers are held in Connecticut at an archive there, and uh, with, with Schaefer here. So the 1970s, post Stonewall, the Kansas City community really reflects what's going on nationally in terms of the gay and lesbian community really trying to figure out 
what it's about, trying to ascertain what it's going to be. Um, the militancy that accompanies the Stonewall riots is clearly effective and successful, but can't be sustained over time. That, that, that heat is gonna burn itself out. And so then what we see is a community that has come out, but what's next? And so within these kinds of early 70s advocacy groups, what we see is attempts to really try to define what they're going to be and what they're going to do and what they're going to advocate for. Like I said, on a national scale, and we see that reflected in the activities of the groups that bubble up during the course of the decade here in Kansas City. The first one is the Kansas City Women's Liberation Union, which starts in 1970. Start dates and end dates are real hard to pin down for some of these groups um, because we either don't have the documentation or we assume they stop because there are no more newsletters. So it's, it's pinpointing the dates are, 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 are challenging, uh, challenging to do. But the WLU starts in 1970 and it, it's, it's a perfect reflection of the blending of the issues of the feminist community with the lesbian community, during, particularly during the early 1970s. The, the phrase at the time was, uh, Feminism is the theory, lesbianism is the practice. And so you see the issues that are of concern to feminists being reflected in the activities of um, the Women's Liberation Union that are also of concern to the lesbian community. Things like uh, family and work and trying to find new forms of work and equal pay and appearance, physical appearance, language, the sexism of current day language. All those sorts of issues are being addressed in the publications of the Women's Liberation Union, which also had a women's center at 5138 Tracy, just over by UMKC. This is a later newsletter from the same group from 1975. Personally, I am drawn to the publications of these advocacy groups as well as the commercial publications that are put out in the community because they tell so much about the evolution of the community and the development of the organization. And you see instantly a, a little more professional appearance and a little more sophisticated approach to, to their public communication. In 1973, the Women's Liberation Union takes over operation of New Earth Books and Records, which was a sort of um, alternative uh, gay and lesbian hippie uh, bookstore that eventually landed at the northwest corner of 39th and Main. That's this building here. I think there's a bike shop there now. And um, the group operates the, the bookstore for a number of years. And this is a very charming little hand-drawn floor map of the, of the bookstore from about this period, 74, 75. Really, really sweet. 1971, the Gay People's Union forms on the campus of UMKC as a student group. Because they do not receive recognition from the campus or system administration, they therefore do not receive funding, and so they move off campus. In 1973, um, and this is a brochure from about that time period from the community Gay People's Union. This is the front and the back cover, and this is the inside of the same brochure talking about the four areas that the Gay People's Union focuses on. Education, um, rap groups and rap sessions are, are really, really prevalent during this period, so you see a lot of reference to those. GPU also uh, sponsored a lot of social activities, dances, uh, picnics, and di holiday dinners, and that sort of thing. Just an alternative to connecting socially outside of bars. I get the sense, though there's nothing in the documentation, that a lot of the folks who are associated with GPU are uh, underage, so they can't get into bars. Political activities, uh, GPU uh, does lobbying, does picketing, um, sponsors some litigation, and then general referral services, uh, places uh, referring folks to uh, counselors or sympathetic religious leaders, 
or uh, as Kevin alluded to, uh, VD information and some and legal referrals as well. This is the newsletter of the GPU from October of 1974. It is literally a letter. It is typewritten, it's on very acidic paper, and largely what it documents are the activities of the organization. This is uh, a year later and looks a little more professional, a little more designed, and the content reflects a growing sophistication within the organization in that it includes both local and national news, the cover story talking about um, the Leonard Matlovich story, the, guy, the army sergeant who came out on the cover of Time in 1975, also includes uh, activities of the organization as well, but there's, there's meatier content within the covers of, of the newsletter. This is a calendar from that same issue. Uh, features events not only of the organization, but um, the Women's Liberation Union, the Metropolitan Community Church, which, Metropolitan Community Church, which had started in 1973, a couple of the local bars in town. So really trying to be a, another clearinghouse for local information for the gay and lesbian community in the city. As part of their educational outreach, they sponsored in July of 1974 a gay straight rap, Sexual Myths and Realities, which featured sessions on things like lesbianism and the lesbian lifestyle, uh, bisexuality, transvestites, and the gay community and the church. In 1975, they partner with the Women's Liberation Union, the Metropolitan Community Church, and a very short-lived organization called the Joint Committee on Gay Rights to sponsor the first Heart of America Gay Pride Festival, the first Gay Pride Festival in Kansas City. This was a big deal, it was a three-day event. It was a Friday night, an all-day Saturday thing, and a most-day Sunday thing. And lots of sessions going on that address each of those four areas that the GPU was interested in focusing on. You'll notice that the festival takes place at the Gay Community Center, which is located at 3825 Virginia. They had opened that center the year before in October of 74, and this is a sweet little invitation to the um, opening reception for what was then called the Gay Community House, again, over on Virginia. And you'll note that the invitation comes from the Gay People's Union and Gay Community Services. Again, no proof in the documentation, but I get the sense that Gay Community Services was a subgroup of the Gay People's Union. Because by the end of 75, the GPU really starts to dissolve and fade away, and GCS, Gay Community Services, continues. This is volume one, number one, of their newsletter from, uh, it's actually 76, excuse me. And you'll notice the editor, uh, first name Willing and last name Abel. Um, GCS sort of continues the same initiatives that were started by Gay People's Union with a little bit more emphasis on the services. They, they took on more of a referral role, um, getting people connected to the information that they were seeking as opposed to investing a lot of energy uh, in politics uh, or uh, social activities. That's not to say they weren't a busy place. This is the uh, December of 1975 calendar what I find really funny is on the 23rd and the 24th, as you, if you can see there, they went caroling down at the mall at Liberty Memorial, which just tickled me to no end. I thought that was very, very funny. <laughs> GCS also extends the, develop, the, the development of the professionalism of some of these organizations. And this to me is very reflective of that. These are the ads that appeared in the December 1975 issue of the newsletter. And so that tells us a couple of things right off the bat. Number one, there's a growing interest in the community for this new emerging market, very clearly. And number two, the folks at GCS had the wherewithal to recognize the importance of advertising, to assign somebody to go out and sell these ads, and then generate revenue for the organization. 
Like GPU, GCS also sponsored a number of rap sessions, and these are the topics of the weekly rap sessions uh, from the summer of 1976. All over the place, and then the folks there on the right who uh, led, the, led the talks. Also in the summer of 1976, the National Republican Convention comes to Kansas City. And I don't find anything in the papers of the GCS or the GPU or the Women's Liberation Union that indicate an organized response to the convention. There was a protest um, of some community members and supporters of the gay and lesbian community, but there's no indication that that, that particular protest was organized by any of these, any of these groups. In 1977, by this point, GCS is also gone. All indications would point to the fact that GCS is gone. And so, after the Pride Festival in June of that year, Christopher Street Association is founded. And you can see the directors there, Judy Brock, Kenneth Green, Leah Hopkins, who, by the way, had a letter published in this morning's paper congratulating um, the football player at MU, and Michael Tersey. Leah Hopkins served as the spokesperson for the Christopher Street Association, and their timing was fortuitous. Like I said, they started in June of 77. They were formed. Next month, we, give it, we get a visit from this person. <laughs> Anita Bryant, um, former Miss America, a mildly successful pop singer, launches a campaign earlier in 77, in the spring of 77 in Miami, to lead the repeal of a gay rights ordinance in Dade County. She asserted that because gays and lesbians could not reproduce, they had to recruit children to become gay and lesbian. And so she wanted to keep them out of the schools. She got the ordinance repealed, which led to the repeal of similar ordinances across the country, including Wichita. And she comes, and so this launches a new career for her. She goes across the country and uh, spouts her rabid anti-gay and lesbian uh, vitriol. She comes to Kansas City in July to perform for the National Conference of the Christian Booksellers Association that takes place at Municipal Auditorium, where she is met with protests that were organized by the Christopher Street Association. There was a group that first met at Liberty Memorial to protest her appearance. They then walked up to the auditorium and connected with a, a larger group, and accounts give their numbers of somewhere between 400 and 500 people protesting the appearance of this person in town. I'm also told by Kay that the woman in the striped dress and the woman next to her are partners in her law firm. So this is an iconic image there in, in the law office. So 400 to 500 people protesting uh, Anita Bryant's appearance here in the town. Remember, I don't think I mentioned it, the name of her, the name of her effort was Save Our Children. And so this young man poignantly points out that we are indeed your children. Christopher Street Association also coordinates the Pride events for 1978 and 1979. The 79 event, as outlined, as described in this issue of a local publication, the parade started at Liberty Memorial, marched up Grand Street, across 11th to Main, and then back down to Liberty Memorial. So quite a hike, and they all then afterwards gathered at the base of the memorial where this photograph was taken. I don't see any evidence of Christopher Street Association lasting past 1980. And by the time we get to the 80s, the country itself, as uh, indicated by the rise of people like Anita Bryant, the country itself has moved really rightward. Of course, Ronald Reagan is voted in to office in 1980 as well. The moral majority takes place on national stage. Things like that are going on. And so it's, it's a period of, of the absence of a number of these, these kinds of groups in Kansas City 
until such time that the AIDS crisis hits later on in the decade, in the mid-1980s, when other types of groups have to be formed to address that particular crisis because there's no response initially from the local, state, or federal government. And so that community energy is expended towards working on this health crisis as opposed to advocating for civil rights. And then you see other groups emerging out of, of that energy that then in turn do start to advocate once again for civil rights. And Kay will now talk about some of those groups. Um, thank you. And this is fascinating. I think this is just great. I've, I've learned a whole lot. Um, and I also want to thank you for, the, uh, for those that organize this for the opportunity for me to dig out of those boxes that I have of, from all the information that I've got. Remember, I'm the lawyer. I'm not the academic. Um, I don't know much about PowerPoints. I had no idea I was going to be able to see it up here, too. So I'll do my best to talk and click at the same time. I want to mention the first organization that I ever worked with um, when I went to work for um, my law firm. Uh, I went to work there in 85. And there was an organization that existed then and that had been around for a while called Gay Organized Alliance for Liberation. I don't have, we don't have a slide about it. And I know it was around at least in 1983 because another member of my law firm, Howard Iceberg, he's not with us anymore, but I mean, well, he's alive, but he's just not a member of the firm. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to start a rumor about Howard being dead. Um, he represented uh, Susan Johnson, who was one of the people involved with Goal, because she tried to get the Kansas City um, Area Transportation Authority to run ads on the buses, and they wouldn't, and he sued them, and he won. So uh, that, and that fits in real well with member Sally and uh, Kathy. Uh, and Kathy, unfortunately, really isn't with us anymore. And Sally's not a member of my firm either. But you know, I was thrilled to get to go work with these people because they were so, so wonderfully progressive. And Gold also came to our office and asked us to put together packets of forms that gays and lesbians could use in their personal lives uh, to take care of some of their, their business and their health, You know, those powers of attorney that we still need, by the way. If you don't have one, you need to get them. Um, those powers, then, uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, papers to uh, uh, releases to see each other in the hospital. Remember, it used to be hard for same-sex partners to see each other in hospitals. That was another thing we did. So we put together packets for individuals, but we also did that for, um, we sent them out to hospitals, to area hospitals, and asking the hospitals to, um, to approve these forms. And I did all these letters, and, uh, and the hospitals would write back these really long um, legal letters about why they weren't going to do this. And, Except, and they, you know, it was like a case by case basis. And if you bring it, if somebody brings the forms, we'll honor it probably. But they weren't going to do a wholesale acceptance. And except for the VA, the VA was pretty good. And even though they didn't accept the forms either, they said they at least tried to be compassionate and let same sex people visit each other. Okay, so let's see if I can do my first slide here. Yes. So this is the March on Washington. Uh, which was in 1987, October 11th, 1987. And between either 100, 000, well, between 100,000 and 500,000 people, uh, gay and lesbian people and their supporters, marched on Washington in October of 1987. In looking through my files, I found uh, that at the march, 2,000 gay couples exchanged vows in a ceremony of rights, as it was called, in front of the IRS building which is incredibly interesting because, you know, remember that it was in the Windsor case where we won uh, the, the downfall of Section 3 of DOMA just last summer, and that was the case against the IRS. I just thought that was fascinating. Um, I found a talk that I gave to some group af after the march, after I'd been to the march, in which I reflected that the march was more than I had hoped for, to be in a city overflowing with gay people everywhere, all types of people from all walks of life. It was incomprehensible to someone from Kansas City, Missouri in 1987 to be there. So show of hands, who was there at, in 87? Yes, there are a few old people like me. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. 
So this, this slide is about the, where, where the meetings to get ready to go to the march, um, which is where I met some of the, the people like, um, that, I later, that we later started these groups with. Uh, we used to meet at Phoenix Books, which is what the New Earth used to be called, came to be called. So when we got back from uh, the March on Washington, and I mean literally we got back on October 25th, 1987, 13 of us got together at someone's house and we formed a political organization called the Pink Triangle Political Coalition. We picked that name because we wanted to, one, be um, you know, gender neutral, didn't want to say gay, didn't want to say lesbian, and we also wanted to take the symbol that the Nazis had used to, uh, to designate gays in the camps and turn that into a powerful symbol, and it was kind of a common symbol that was being used at the time. Um, by January of 1988, we were having regular meetings, and boy, did we have big plans. We were going to impact AIDS legislation. We were going to repeal the Missouri Sexual Misconduct Law, which was the sodomy statute. We were gonna pass an anti-discrimination ordinance in Kansas City, Missouri. We were gonna lobby on the state, federal, and local level, and we were going to amend the Missouri Adult Abuse Act to include same-sex couples, and we were gonna stop anti-gay and lesbian violence. <laughs> and, and we worked on all of these, we did. Um, this is the the newsletter that we had, and this is a picture of um, Joan Maxwell, and then a woman from, who came from, um, from Washington, I think, to train us on how to lobby. And sure enough, we did go to Jefferson City and we did lobby. And that is me up there, sitting like in the second row. Uh, I didn't used to have hair like this. Um, so, uh, there was a, there was a St. Louis organization that was formed about, this, about the same time called the Privacy Rights Education Project, PREP, and they spearheaded a petition drive to repeal the sexual misconduct statute, and that was one of the things that PTPC worked on. Uh, we also wanted to educate legislators and public officials about homosexuality, and we, uh, we didn't know about all these great publications that had happened, uh, what Kevin told us about, so we published our own little pamphlet, Homosexuality Moving Towards Understanding. You know, we forget that how easy it is. With a little click of our finger, we can learn everything we want now, and it wasn't that way. Uh, we had to, we had to, we, had, we tried to do our own education. We got a, um, our own educating. We got a grant from the um, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force to help us write that. Uh, we also lobbied in Jefferson City and we interviewed and endorsed candidates. So we were doing all of that in the, the late 80s. Um, there was also a mayor's commission on hate group activity in the, in the late 80s that it was then Mayor Richard Berkeley established and it included several representatives from the gay uh, and lesbian community, and its final report urged that, anti, that an anti-discrimination ordinance be passed and that Missouri's hate crime statute be amended. So it was kind of a big deal. You know, we got to be part of this kind of thing. Um, oh, and this, is, um, this was the one-year anniversary of the Pink Triangle Political Coalition um, that my, uh, my partner very nicely did the artwork for us for that. Um, I want to be sure and mention ACT UP. Um, we don't have a slide about ACT UP, but they were also around in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Um, and ACT UP was certainly making itself heard and felt, and there was a press release that was done on November 30th, 89, and I think this will give you a flavor for them. This afternoon at 3 o'clock p.m., Kansas City Council members will meet at City Hall, and during the regular council session, a resolution will be passed recognizing December 1st as World AIDS Awareness Day. During this proclamation, some members of ACT UP KC will interrupt the proceedings to remind the council of its continued lack of response to the AIDS crisis locally. A banner will be unfurled and signs will be held up highlighting the city's negligence. A statement will be read by someone in ACT UP and others will fall to the floor in symbolic death and remain there till the end of the council's session. So that's, you know, there were this, these activists going on. There were, there were those of us who were doing the legislative side, and there were the activists taking to the streets. So by December of 1989, there was a new organization called the Human Rights uh, Ordinance Project, which is actually a predecessor to HRP that is up on the screen at the moment. Um, 
And this was a coalition of between 40 and 50 religious, legal, social, and human rights organizations formed for the specific purpose of amending our anti-discrimination uh, ordinance here in Kansas City, Missouri to add sexual orientation and to clarify that HIV status was included in the definition of disability to also uh, prevent discrimination. And thanks to Catherine Shields, who was on the city council at the time, and Mayor Richard Berkeley, this ordinance made it to the council for a hearing in May of 1990. Well, there were really more than just one hearing. There were lots of hearings. And they were quite something. Um, there were hours of testimony. There was banners. There was emotion. It was heated. It was raucous. It was heartfelt. The chambers were packed. It was really quite, it was really quite something. But uh, the ordinance was set back, back to committee uh, with a lot of gnashing of teeth and uh, anger on, uh, on the HROP's part. Um, there were multiple articles in the newspaper. There were cartoons. If, it, if that happened today, social media would take over and it'd be lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, but we kept working. You know, we, we didn't get our ordinance then, but we kept working. And um, there was HROP morphed into HRP, Human Rights Project. Um, and uh, 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 HRP also worked toward the, getting the ordinance again. Uh, this is this headline. Here's another one. We had a, you know, had a party, of course. And then in May of, uh, of 19, uh, when was it? It was 91. We, oh, this, this was, I'm sorry, this was May of 1990. This was after we lost. This was, we were going to have a party no matter what. And so after we, we lost our ordinance, when we didn't get to vote, the council didn't vote on it because they sent it back to committee. We had this uh, Mother's Day rally, um, and win or lose, rain or shine, the sun, the sun did shine, but we had lost. Um, and here in 1991, we have John Barnett, who's here with us tonight, running for the city council. He was, of course, supported by the Human Rights Project. He lost, but he sure gave it a good run. There he is being endorsed by HRP, along with all these other people, Catherine Shields, Ed Ford, et cetera. Uh, and here, finally, in 1993, we have the ordinance being passed. Um, and uh, by this time, Cle uh, Emmanuel Cleaver was mayor, uh, was mayor, and with a lot of help from Dan Coffrin, um, the, the ordinance was finally passed. And so Kansas City, Missouri in 1993 got its anti-discrimination ordinance. Uh, this was, uh, we, one of the articles that I read that, that I had in my files was about Fired Up, which was kind of the antithesis. We, cre we got such a backlash at times and we cre they created this whole right-wing group called Fired Up, and they were always uh, trying to repeal this or petition this. Um, HRP went, went on. It, it continued uh, it, after the passage of the 93 uh, ordinance. It endorsed candidates. Their pa a PAC was formed. There was a staff members. Um, and it did, it did various, various other things up until about 1997, I think. It was officially dissolved in 1998. And Pink Triangle had been dissolved five years before that. Um, Missouri's sexual misconduct statute was not repealed willingly by the people of Missouri. You may remember that it took the US Supreme Court to do away with those, with the sexual misconduct, the sodomy laws in um, uh, 2003. The Missouri adult abuse laws were eventually amended, as was the state hate crime law. Uh, we still don't have a statewide anti-discrimination -discri law that includes sexual orientation, despite hard work by, by many people. Uh, Governor Nixon just announced that he supports such a move, but we will see what the legislative session brings. Write your senators and your state legislators. Another thing that I wanted to point out was that um, you know, one of those people that's worked so hard in Jefferson City is Jolie Justice. And, uh, but there she was preceded in the 1990s. We had the first gay um, representative to the House in Jefferson City, Tim Van Zant, who uh, was there for eight years. So I wanted to, to point that out, too. And really, that's, uh, that's all I have. I, I really want to thank you all for, 
for coming. And I want to thank you all. I, like I said, there's several people here that, that I recognize. And for those of you who have worked or are working to further equality, you know, it's a good fight and it needs to be kept up. And remember, like that, the opening sign said, the opening, this isn't it, but the opening one said, you know, we're here, we're queer, and we're not going anywhere. Thank you so much. Nice job. So like I mentioned earlier in the evening, this was an overview and there wasn't just there just wasn't enough time to cover all the groups that existed in the history of the city. And these are some of the groups that we just had to leave out. Um, more current day groups, PrEP, which ultimately became Promo in 2001. Promo still exists, Kansas Equality. And you can read them there yourself. You'll notice that some of them are in red. The ones that are in red are the ones that we have no papers from in the Gay and Lesbian Archive of Mid-America. So if you or someone you know was involved or has been or is involved in any, any of these organizations, go back, clean out your filing cabinets, clean out your shoe boxes, and we will be happy to take those materials off your hands. And so with that, I want to echo what Kay said. It is a struggle that continues, and we see it every day. And it's a struggle worth fighting for and that deserves fighting for. And so with the knowledge of the efforts of those who came before us, may that help to continue as we move forward. So with that, I think we'll take um, some questions now. Any questions? I didn't quite hear you, ma'am. What did you allude to? Oh, the, the events that had occurred in the previous couple of weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Michael Sam, Michael Sam, the football player at MU, came out. Um, Eight couples in the state of Missouri filed with the ACLU to have the uh, prohibition of same-sex marriage overturned. The, all the shenanigans over in the state of Kansas where they wanted to strip people essentially of their civil rights from government employees and private businesses. Um, At the conference. We had, uh, uh, we had an amazing conference that was in Kansas City last weekend, the Midwest Let's see. The Midwest Bisexual, Lesbian, Gay, Transgender, Ally College Conference, which brought 2,000 college students from across the Midwest, from across the country, really. We had kids from Florida, from Massachusetts, from Texas, to Kansas City to further the work of some of these groups, to, to educate themselves and, and to become, in some sense, activists on their own, and to gain a really strong affirmation of just being, like Kay mentioned, being in a group of people that are your peers, literally. So those, that's within two weeks. So it's been kind of head-spinny, really. What other kinds of questions? Mr. Fries. Hal, McCall, Hal Call from, from uh, Trenton, Missouri, who uh, put the conference together. By the time it all came around, he was with Mattachine on the West Coast. He went to the MU School of Journalism and had worked in newspapers and publishing and printing. He was at the conference in Kansas City. And I can't help but think that maybe he talked to Drew Schaefer about the possibility of putting something together. And another very interesting thing about the uh, Phoenix newsletters is they are in archives uh, internationally. Yeah. Um, I found them in Canadian archives. They're in certainly on the West Coast and on the East Coast and uh, all around. And 
uh, your your uh, your information and your talk and your research was just bang on. Congratulations yeah. for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. I'm, it was kind of hard cutting down of what I was going to put into it. I know uh, I, I kind of wrapped up my paper for my class purposes back in November, and since then I've probably edited it and added to it about 15 times. And uh, even speaking with Stuart just last week. He had a whole box full of new material that I could add into it, so uh, maybe I read a book or something. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, he passed away from AIDS in the 80s. He passed away of AIDS in the 80s. 1989. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, how much did, because uh, now we, you know, we use the acronym LGBT or LGBTQIA, um, how much did bisexual and transgender rights movements intersect with uh, the lesbian gay rights movements in the various eras you told us about? I guess I'll start. The 60s uh, is, is almost impossible to find anything outside of the gay community in Phoenix. Um, I couldn't even find if there were any uh, lesbian or transgender groups that even attended the National Planning Conference. It, it just the documentation wasn't there. When we get to the 70s, um, really the, the, what we find are, are performative female impersonators, largely. But then at the same time, Esther Newton, who's a well-known sociologist or anthropologist, one of the two, I don't know which, um, she wrote a book on female impersonation uh, in 1968, and she focused on performative female impersonators, but she also focused on what she called street queens. These individuals who would uh, go out on the street, um, typically young people, and wear uh, a wig and typically not very well done makeup in a really confrontational kind of way. And that, to me, at least in Kansas City, would signal uh, more of a trans consciousness than, than being a performing drag queen. Um, the terminology, it's, it's, it's real hit and miss, uh, practically non-existent um, during Kevin's period and largely my period. Uh, you saw the... the uh, weekend seminar where they talked about transvestites. Um, that's very different than what we think of as trans today. And so it's, it's a good question. I don't know where that transition happens. Um, I don't know that it even happens in the 80s and 90s. Well, by the time that the, the ordinance starts being talked about and, and proposed and uh, bef before it actually, I think, made it to the Finance Committee to be discussed. That, that was a discussion that uh, the Human Rights Ordinance Project had, was whether to include transgender. And the decision was made to not include transgender. And that was difficult. So that was, uh, what, 89, something like that. And uh, it was 2012, I think, that uh, transgender was finally added to the discrimination ordinance here in Kansas City. So not something that's easy to talk about. Um, could you talk just a little bit more about, I don't like he everyone hearing my voice that way. <laughs> <laughs> could you talk just a little bit more about the way like race and class kind of intersect with the <laughs> in, term of the, in terms of the 60s, specifically if we're just focusing on Phoenix, uh, most of the members that I found were white. Um, what I did find uh, in kind of the creation of the gay community here in Kansas City, even before that, like just post-World War II, uh, tons of jazz clubs here in Kansas City um, with mostly black musicians and black patrons were very, very accepting of homosexuals to come into their bars. So there, there was a good mix of acceptance there, but in terms of the political organization, um, Phoenix Society was pretty much mostly white, yeah. 
In the 70s, I, I think you see a, a blending more of class than you do of race. I wouldn't necessarily say that all the folks who were involved in these various groups were upper, upper class white men. Um, I think they come from a variety of economic classes. Clearly what you also see is a segregation between men and women. There was a separate women's group, and intentionally, and the resources that I have looked at indicate that GPU and gay community services were largely men's groups. There was some women involvement. Um, the bars socially were segregated. There were women's bars and there were men's bars. And there was a little bit of overlap, but largely they were segregated by gender. Um, and it's not really until you see someone like Leah Hopkins, who's, who's an African-American woman. She was actually the first African-American Playboy bunny at the Playboy Club in New York City. She was a model. And she relocated back to Kansas City and saw this segregation both by sex and by race and was really thrown, kind of thrown for a loop by it. And she talks in some of the resources that I've seen about that experience and what that was like um, to be the visible spokesperson as an African American, as a woman, for this gay rights organization. And as far as the, the late 80s and the early 90s, well, one of the problems that the ordinance faced was, even though there were great people like Reverend uh, Mac Charles Jones, some of you may remember as the pastor of St. Stephen's, very supportive, but some uh, Afro-American ministers really were very opposed and still are very opposed to um, to same-sex couples homosexuality so that was a problem you know and the other thing about um, uh, I don't know about class so much I can't really comment about class I, I, I'm not getting anything in my head about class um, but about the segregation between men and women you know the the AIDS crisis um, I think kind of for a while I don't want to say it was divisive but it was it you know, it was men mostly. The women, lesbians may have been supportive, but it was focused on men. So what ACT UP was mainly male uh, dominated. Now, as far as the work on the ordinance went, that was mixed. I mean, we had, you know, uh, men and women, um, uh, but predominantly, um, predominantly white also. I just wanted to mention that you might want to look at some of the uh, nursing literature at the national level. I went to work at American Nurses Association in 1976 when they were located in Kansas City. And in 1972, they had done their first publication called uh, Affirmative Action Programming for the a Nursing Profession. And they had gay people on the boards of the 70s. They had the first African-American board member in 1949 or 50. So they have a real rich history uh, related to their affirmative action task force and their commission on human rights, where they were looking at the you know, broad spectrum across all populations. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, during the Stonewall riots, what kind of response did Kansas City have, if any? Uh, uh, well, Phoenix really mixed. Uh, the, the younger group was, you know, engaged, uh, militant uh, with it, uh, but the older group of Phoenix were a little more conservative, less, uh, less willing to just kind of throw open the doors to where you kind of see the split, and it's, it's also part of why they, f they start to fall apart. Um, the house was obviously costing Drew tons of money, and that was kind of a, a financial reason to disband, but they had <coughs> groups going to Jefferson City to do protest marches, and then it was, the, it was mostly the younger crowd of Phoenix going. Uh, there was kind of this generational split that really kind of was affected by Stonewall. I will relate to you uh, a story that was told to us during an oral history interview with a couple of elderly community members, Victor Peck and Victor Golyutsa. Uh, Victor G has since passed. Victor Peck is still living. They talk about Kansas City's own little Stonewall riot. And they had heard about Stonewall that summer. And they were regular bar goers. And as regular bar goers, they knew that bars got raided in town just like everywhere else. And so they were at a bar downtown shortly after Stonewall, and the bar got raided. And they 
took, the police only took one person, or maybe a couple of people, to jail. Everyone in the bar, having been influenced by Stonewall, said, well, we're just not gonna, we're not gonna put up with this. And so they followed the paddy wagon. They walked by, the bar was downtown, like 10th and McGee. So they, they followed the paddy wagon, they walked behind the paddy wagon and walked into the police department and said, if you're gonna, and there were a number of them, and there were a couple of dozen folks that followed the truck. And they said, if you're gonna arrest this guy, you need to arrest all of us. And the officer, at the desk officer said, oh, just all of you, go on, get out of here. And no one was arrested. And after that point, they report that the bars were no longer raided. So it wasn't nearly as militant, but um, same effect. I haven't looked for coverage in the Star for Stonewall, they did cover actually the, the planning conference for NACO when it was here in February of 66, but um, I haven't seen anything, I haven't actually looked. It's a good question, I should look uh, to see if they did cover the, the riots. Um, I was just wondering uh, if maybe uh, 70s don't seem that long ago, but maybe question about oral history about class and race in the 70s. I think that maybe we need some oral histories in the 70s too because um, uh, the women's liberation organizations and the gay men organizations uh, they may have been separate, uh, but in my experience, uh, the, the organizations were separate, um, but the, um, the, uh, the people weren't separate, that there was, they were friends, and uh, they spent time together uh, socially and uh, and um, that there wasn't this big divide and it would be a shame for historically for those to thought that in Kansas City that there was this big divide between and in the 70s uh, and that there was some kind of class divide also or racial when in my experience there wasn't uh, I, I, I don't know you'd have to do some oral histories to s that were in fact the case but it seemed very uh, cosmopolitan to me I would love to sit, sit with a recorder in front of about half this audience, to be quite honest, <laughs> um, because it, between the scant document, documentary evidence that we have, coupled with people's stories of the period, that's how we're able to fill in the entire picture. And I'm, I'm pleased to share with you that I'll be working with Wick Thomas, this nice young man standing up here in the front, to do um, a series of oral histories. That's our next series of oral histories. Um, he works with a young uh, youth group, a queer youth group, and they're going to talk with uh, folks uh, who have been around in the community for a little bit longer and, and get some of those stories. And believe me, we're trying to capture as many of, of the community members as we can throughout various periods. We're starting with the folks who've been around the longest, because they're going to be around the shortest, presumably, and then work our way to folks who are around in, in the 70s. So I'm, I'm totally on board with you. Sure. I, first of all, Stuart, I just want to say thank you so much for what you do. And I learned things here, and I thought, really? I, I, thought I was a pretty strong historian. And, and your work is great, because I was always under the impression that the NACO, if I'm saying that right, meeting was at the President Hotel. So it's really good to know that it was at this other location. <laughs> and uh, I can't help but note that we're about two years away from the 50th anniversary of a significant national event. 
one organization I did not see in any of their slides or conversation is the 10400 Club. And it was, it's an, it was a social organization. Right. Um, but it, <laughs> it was vitally important when I, I moved to Kansas City in the, in the mid to late 70s. You know, that's, we all went out to Aggie's Farm up, by, uh, up north of the city. And it was men and women. And this, this question about the separation between men and women, there were women's bars. I, there was a period in my life when I preferred to go to the women's bars. And, and there were women that came to the gay bars. The cabaret had split levels. But there was, there was separation, but there was also a lot. We also had a lot of um, crossover in our friendships and socializing, didn't we, Kay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, the other issue that somebody else raised, and I just look around the room here. I've been working in gay rights in Kansas City since the 70s. And there's one thing that, that I keep seeing over and over again. This room is you know, 95%, 99% white. And I know a lot of African American gay and lesbian people, but there has never really been success at bridging the racial divide in this city. And it's not unique to gay and lesbian issues. Um, and I'm just going to share one story I remember when I was working, um, when I first moved here in the 70s, and I worked for a remodeling company that was all gay and lesbian, and uh, we had a, a black woman who worked there, and I have no idea why this happened to me, but she invited me on a Saturday night to go to a party with her, and I am the only male and the only white person in the basement of this house with at least, if, you know, I'm, I have this problem with recovered memories, but I'm thinking 50 to 100 black lesbians. There is a history in Kansas City for people of color, Latino, African American, who are gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and transgendered, and it's hidden. Lama doesn't have it. It's not documented well, and that's um, and so I'm not real sure what the question was, but it's a, it's a historic issue and a struggle that we've fought against and tried to overcome. And as white people, we're not very good at that. And, and we, we rely on people of color to rise up and challenge us to be included because they are here, you are here, um, but not very visible. And there's still a lot, long ways to go in that area. This, this is John Barnett, by the way, for those of you that don't know him. This is the guy that ran for city council. Thanks for that setup, John. Uh, Chris Release, one of the founders of Glamma, and uh, one of the things we know we need to do uh, as an organization, which was founded by four middle-class white men and middle-aged white men, um, is be more inclusive uh, of diverse voices in the community. So this year, we don't know exactly when, we are forming a community advisory team uh, to uh, be inclusive of voices and also be an introduction to other communities that we don't on the surface have an immediate invitation to join. So please keep your ear to the ground. Uh, we're short on women's history, really short on history of people of color. In Glamour, we know we want to include it so uh, we look forward to your being our ambassador uh, in the community and letting people know that there is a home for our history here in Kansas City and we want it to be as inclusive uh, as possible. So we're counting on all of you to uh, shepherd that message for us uh, as much as you can. Thanks. And one other project that I want to mention um, that John alluded to, uh, 2016 is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Phoenix Society for Individual Freedom and the planning conference for NACO. And at, as John's idea, and um, I think it's a, an excellent one for Glamour to pursue, is some sort of public commemoration of those events in that year, since it's the 50th anniversary, whether that's a plaque or a statue, or a fountain, or whatever it might be. It, it's time to recognize that piece of Kansas City's history that no one knows about, and do that publicly. And so we will be looking at ways to make that happen. Of course, there'll be fundraising, and they'll be working with the city, or with parks, or whoever. Um, so cross your fingers that that works. But if you're inclined, let us know, and we would welcome the opportunity to start that conversation and start that process, because it is, it is time, and it is an event worth commemorating. 
So with that, I, on behalf of my fellow panelists, thank you all so much for your interest thank and you. your attention. Thank you very really, much. really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice job.